One of the Inner Circle members asked, can you please explain to me the purpose of the Jewish sacrificial system? The idea of slaughtering animals to please the gods seems very primitive and idolatrous to me. Is this what it's all about? Okay, fantastic question. So let's, let's start from exactly where your question is, which is, is this idolatry? It sure looks like it. So it's interesting because Maimonides, the Rambam, says something like that in his Guide for the Perplexed, in the Mor Nevuchim. If you look there in section 3, subsection 46, he asks essentially your question. And there he elaborates and he explains how the ancient idol worshippers practiced sacrifices. And in order to wean the Jewish nation from their idolatrous practices, but in small, bite-sized, handleable steps, God asked us to bring sacrifices, but in very different ways than the idolaters. So we would continue bringing sacrifices, which is something that we were used to from those cultures, but we would do it in such a way that it would be very different. Different sects believed it was wrong to sacrifice sheep, or different sects believed it was wrong to sacrifice goats, or it was wrong to sacrifice cattle. So we, Dafka specifically sacrificed sheep and goats and cattle. The idol worshippers only offered uh, leaven bread, bread that had risen in their sacrifices. So we generally offered unleavened bread, matzahs. They offered sweet sacrifices dipped in honey, but never salt. So we offered sacrifices that were dipped in salt, but with no honey. According to this passage in the Rambam, we wouldn't have given up sacrifices altogether, but this whole area of service of God was intended to shake us loose from the practices of these idolaters. That was the intention, to set us aside and make us different from them. Okay, now, at least that's how this passage in the Rambam, in the Mor Nevuchim 346 is interpreted by many people. Go take a look, see what you think the Rambam is saying. Many people interpret it this way. However, I got to tell you that many scholars, uh, both medieval and modern, serious scholars, have argued that this little passage is just one microscopic picture of a slice of the Rambam's belief about sacrifices. And that even the Rambam believed that there was much more to them, much more to them psychologically, much more to them spiritually. And that sacrifices are lechatchila, they're, they're an ideal, and we, should, we want them to be reinstated as soon as possible. They're not bidiev, they're not just a concession to some primitive culture. And the Rambam himself held that way, according to many people. So, what could be behind sacrifices? Why did God want them, ideally? And if, if God does want them, and we're looking forward to the rebuilding of the temple so that we can bring them again, then why do they seem so bizarre to us? In other words, let's be straight. I mean, I think sacrifices seem weird. Why do they seem weird to me if they're so good? I mean, if so, if you ask me, how do you feel, Labe, about giving staka? I would say giving staka, giving uh, uh, charity. That sounds great. How do you feel about healing the sick? Oh, healing the sick, wonderful. Yeah. How do you feel about having a just legal system? I love it. How do you feel about sacrifices? Ugh. Why is that? Why do I feel that way? If it's truly good, what's wrong with me that I feel that way? So to understand, I'm not gonna do justice to, to sacrifices in just the few minutes that we have, but the most basic picture, there, there's basically three categories of sacrifices. There's the Korban Ola, the Korban Chatas, and the Korban Shlamim. I'm oversimplifying. The Korban Ola is a burnt offering brought twice a day. It's brought on festivals. It's brought for a new moon. It's brought on certain special occasions. With a Korban Ola, all the animal's flesh is slowly burnt on the altar. Okay, it, The whole thing goes up. That's why it's called a Korban Ola. goes up. Basically, 100% gift to God, if you could imagine giving a gift to God, whatever that means. We'll have to try to understand that right now. Okay, The Korban Chatas, a sin offering, was brought for sins that were committed unintentionally, uh, accidentally. If, if intentional sins required another form of atonement. But if someone did something unintentionally, 
then they could bring a korban chatas, a sin offering. Okay, the this korban is uh, partially consumed on the altar, burnt on the altar. The remainder is uh, eaten by the, uh, the, I'm sorry, there, there, there's also a, a korban shlamim. A korban shlamim is partially consumed on the altar and the remainder is eaten, eaten by the owner of the korban shlamim and the priests. Okay, so we have three different types of korbanos here. Korban ola, korban chatas, korban shlamim. Okay, now, the common thread in all of these sacrifices is that the person bringing the sacrifice would let go of something very valuable, something costly, something we don't want to let go of, and we would offer it to God. Now, when I say something costly, I mean a cow. A cow is, what, 2,000 pounds of meat? How much does 2,000 pounds of kosher meat go for on the market these days? It's an enormous, enormous sacrifice for a person. When I say sacrifice, I mean in the modern concept of the word sacrifice, you're, you're, you're letting go of something that is really precious to you. You're not going to want to let go of it. Even a sheep, you know, it would be like, you, you, do you want to let go of your microwave? Do you want to let go of your Corvette? Do you want to let go of your dining room table? These are not things that you would just toss into the street. So all of these sacrifices are very concrete declarations that, you know what? Life is not all about me and my will and my pleasure. Life's about God and God's will and pleasing God. Now, obviously, God does not need my sacrifices. God doesn't need anything. But I need to recognize that I am not at the center of the universe. God is. And the deed shapes the heart. So when I take my possessions, my pleasure, my wealth, and I say, you know what? I'm not that important. God is the most important. And I let go of these things that I don't want to let go of. That has a subconscious impact on me, a spiritual impact on me. Okay, now, if you're not buying this yet, you will in 30 seconds. You recognize that the vast majority of people in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, San Diego, have no problem sanctioning the killing and consumption of cows. The vast majority of people have no problem with it. Americans slaughter about 39 million cows a year. Why? So that they can enjoy the physical pleasure of eating a burger or a steak. To kill 39 million cows is okay if it's for my pleasure. That's not morally problematic in most Westerners' eyes. But letting go of what I want as a gesture to God to show that God is more important than me, that's morally problematic. That bothers Westerners. Even if like a Corbin Shlamim, the animal's barbecued and the steak is eaten by the owners, but the mere fact that in some way this is not for me, it's for God, that's offensive. Sacrificial killing of animals would bring PETA down on you in a moment. They would go crazy over this. You're giving something to God, and it doesn't make a difference that I eat it as well. It's a sacrificial offer to God. You're, there's something more important in the world than you. That makes people crazy. And of course, the less pleasure the owners personally derive from the meat, then for a Westerner, the more morally problematic the sacrifice appears. And obviously the reason is we're a hedonistic society and the ultimate purpose of all physicality in Western eyes is my pleasure. Hence, even a Corbin Shlamim, which could be justified as a holy steak, we bring it on the altar, but then we get to eat it. Still, in Western eyes, there can be no justification for a Corbin Ola because a Corbin Ola is given entirely to God for God's sake. Okay, now, of course, God doesn't need the steak what God wants is for me to let go of it, to recognize that there's something bigger in the world than me. It's not that he wants the stake, it's that he wants me to let go of it. Perhaps, Corbanos, and I'm gonna come back to that name for sacrifices in a minute. Corbanos, a very interesting name. Perhaps Corbanos highlight the fundamental difference between Judaism and Western culture, and that's why we're so bothered by them. The, the greatest, ideal of the Western world is love. We are a romantic culture. 
If you we read Western literature, it's romantic literature. We are a society that idealized love. And that's the word that we use. We use the word love. If you want to know what that word means, you don't need to look in a dictionary. Just look at how people use the word. We say, I love baseball. I love hot dogs. I love my wife. Did I misuse the word in any of those three instances? All three of those were proper uses of the word love. And they all mean the same thing. When I say I love hot dogs, it means hot dogs bring me pleasure. When I say I love baseball, baseball brings me pleasure. When I say I love my wife, what I mean is my wife brings moi, me, pleasure. Love is all about me, me, me. It's all about what brings me pleasure. In Judaism, is there such a thing as love? Well, look that up in a dictionary. Love, translate it into Hebrew, go to Google Translate. Love comes out, Ava. Turns out, Ava is not the translation of love. It's the antithesis of love. Ava is from the three-letter root, Aleph, He, Bet, which is really a two-letter root, Hav, which means give, preceded by the Aleph, which means I will, first person future. Ahav is I will give. Ava is the state of I will giveness. It's a state I go into where all I want to do is take what I have and give it to you. I want to sacrifice for your sake to make you happy. If you pull a guy off the street and you say, in Hebrew, you say, Ata ohev ota? Do you love her? So he can't just ask, does she bring me pleasure? Because that's not the question you're asking him. You're asking him, do you want to let go of what you've got do you want to let go of what brings you pleasure to bring her pleasure? He has to ask, what would I be willing to let go of for her sake? If I want tacos and she wants pizza, would I pass on the tacos to give her the pizza? That's called ahav. That's called love. Love is not about me, me, me. It's all about her, her, her. It's about the opposite, the other. So the Western ideal is love, me, me, me. The Jewish ideal is about the other, letting go of what I want for the other's sake. That's a sign of Ahava. And of course, both of these cultures, the West and Judaism, have institutions which are built on these concepts. The Western world has an institution built on love called marriage. If you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, one of the definitions there is marriage is a merger of two or more corporate entities. And that's not a mistranslation of the word marriage. Marriage is, I'll take out the trash if you'll do the dishes. I'll earn the money if you'll take care of the kids. It's a 50-50 deal. I'll do my half if you do your half. It's a merger of two or more corporate entities. But of course, what happens in a merger of two or more corporate entities if one of the entities doesn't fully carry its weight? What happens if I have a company and one of the divisions of the company is not carrying its weight? Then we jettison that division of the company. That's called divorce. And what are the odds in a relationship that for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, both people will always carry their half of the obligation? People don't go through periods of depression? People don't go through periods of misbehavior, tough times in life where they do the wrong thing. Eventually, that's going to happen in every relationship, which means if you're involved in love and marriage, a merger of two more corporate entities, which is completely self-centered, when the other division is not carrying its weight, you jettison them, which is why most American marriages end in divorce. Look at the institution that's built on Ava. The institution built on Ava is called Nisuin. Nisuin is from the Hebrew root, nun, sin, aleph, no se, to carry. Nisuin is carryings, plural. What does it mean? On the day you go under the chup, under the marriage canopy, you pick up your spouse and you say, you know what, no matter how heavy you get, I'll never put you down. I'm going to carry you forever. It's not a 50-50 deal. It's a 100-100 deal. Each person says, I exist to make your dreams come true. I'm going to let go of what I want for your sake, the other says. So, that's a stable relationship and more. It's not selfish. It's not profitable. It's loving, truly loving. The word in Hebrew for sacrifices is korbanot, from the word karov, which means close. These are things that cause closeness. What things cause closeness? When I let go of what I want to teach myself that it's all about you, that draws me close to you. It helps me break down this room full of mirrors that I live in all the time, looking only at myself as the center of the universe. 
and then I can actually connect with you. So it turns out, Corbanos, letting go of what you want, something really expensive, something really precious, that's what brings you into the world of real connection, which is why sacrifices are called Corbanos. So it's not idolatry. It's the exact opposite of idolatry. Idolatry is all about me getting what I want. If I want this, I'll worship that God. If I want that, I'll worship that other God over there. And if I need that third thing, I'll worship that God because he's in charge of the third thing. Idolatry is all about extracting from the universe whatever you want. It's a, it's a spiritual vending machine. And what's Judaism? Judaism is all about love. Love your neighbors yourself. Love Hashem. Ava. Let go of what you want for the sake of the other. You'll fall into a relationship. I hope you enjoyed this. You can access many more hours of free, eye-opening content from Rabbi Kellerman at lawrencekellerman.com.